Hello, I'm Jan Painter, and I would like to welcome you again to our program, Politics Matters. We now begin the conclusion of our two-part series on immigration, and our guest today is Professor Douglas Ford. Professor Ford is lecturer, general faculty, and director of the Immigration Law Clinic at the Law School of the University of Virginia. Douglas Ford received an AB from Bowdoin College in 83 and a JD from Northeastern University School of Law in 1996. Professor Ford is an immigration attorney at the Legal Aid Justice Center in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is also coordinator of the Legal Aid Pro Bono Immigration Project in partnership with the law firm of Hunton and Williams and the law school's Mortimer Kaplan Public Service Center. He has also worked as a policy analyst for the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants in Washington, D.C., having served as well as Senior Research Associate and Deputy Director of the Bosnia Projects with Physicians for Human Rights. He is the co-editor of Human Rights Advocacy Stories, along with Dina R. Hurwitz and Margaret L. Satterthwaite in 2009. In his thought-provoking book, Americans in Waiting, The Story of Immigration and Citizenship in the United States, Hiroshi Motomura explores the idea of whether we can be a nation of immigrants and still be one nation. He ventures the quintessentially American hope that through immigration, we may come to experience a deeper sense of belonging and thus participate in all areas of American life, be they social, political, economic, moving forward with a respect for all individuals. In part two of our series on immigration, we now consider this idea through the lens of our particular community of Charlottesville, Virginia, and our response to the far-flung travelers and adventurers who seek to join our community. Welcome, Professor Ford. Thanks for the invite. I asked your colleague in the previous program uh, last time, what, what brought you to the field of immigration law, the pro bono immigration project, and human rights work in particular? Well. And my <laughs> my introduction may be a bit more prosaic from a simple youthful love of travel and um, I remember getting to do a Boy Scout trip and I was in high school and getting to go cross country and then um, my family took a cross country trip and then I drove cross country when I graduated from uh, from undergrad and just seeing the difference in our own country and understanding you know cultural difference across the United States was something that just fascinated me and I loved it and um, and from there ended up taking uh, a real intriguing trip where I, I basically rode a bicycle across much of Africa and the way people who had nothing to do with me knew nothing about me looked at me as the most bizarre creature that could have ridden into their town square how well they treated me just on a human level just created such a wonderful sense of, of common humanity and, the, and kind of left me eternally an optimist about the way people can be, such that you know, basic ideas like human rights, where human is the modifier as opposed to, to citizen or even some of the ways we think of our constitutional rights, it's our common humanity that gives us some of these basic um, basic claims on a level of treatment from each other and from, go and from governments. And um, that just kind of has continued to inform my work. And I was lucky enough to work with Physicians for Human Rights in the Balkans after the wars there and saw great tragedy, but also saw the resilience of folks and how, how difficult it was, but how people had to overcome great abuse and how they had to figure out how to live with one another. and, and in fact can, although it's very difficult. And so I also, through Physicians for Human Rights and U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, got to work on this side of it and, and how people come to the United States and resources and, uh, and things that can be done to help them. So that's how I ended up in kind of immigration and human rights. That's very interesting. Having discussed in our first segment the history of U.S. immigration law and policy, as well as the particularized requirements for immigrants who seek entry 
Who comes, a professor, to the Charlottesville community? And what specific challenges do they encounter upon arrival based on your experiences? Maybe I, one of the things in thinking about this type of question I, is to give a little just data on our overall national situation and then localize it. Foreign born is the data point uh, that's used in talking about immigrants because some foreign born become citizens. So in fact, it's not you know, our citizens include foreign born, but the foreign born are um, approximately 38 million or around 13% of our, our population of 300 million. Um, 50 plus percent are Latino, 25 plus are Asian. In Virginia, we have a population of almost 8 million and approximately 10% or 800,000 are foreign born. And here in uh, Charlottesville, Albemarle, I, I'm a little uncertain of exactly how the latest census data are, are playing out, but I think it's around 10 or 11,000, or uh, roughly 7 to 8% of our population of, as I understand it, roughly 145,000, talking about Charlottesville and Albemarle. And, um, and here, likewise, the largest group are Latinos, but a significant group of Asians. Um, and here, we have probably a more diverse mix outside of the northern Virginia suburbs because of the university. I mean, as with much of the state, we're seeing a rise in immigration. A lot of that is, is Latino for some of the, the different uh, lower income type of work. But we're also seeing, I mean, there's just an article in the Post the, uh, the other day about the, the rise in Asian immigration in the northern Virginia suburbs, but I think that's true in, in much of the rest of Virginia as well. And then we have the particular distinction of the university and all the research and stu uh, researchers and you know, faculty, academics, students that come, as well as, for a small town, a pretty large um, refugee resettlement program through the International Rescue Committee, one of the kind of legendary immigration and refugee agencies you know, in the country. And th they are part of the federally mandated and funded uh, refugee program that I believe colleague Professor Martin briefly alluded to. And, and they are part of a system nationally that bring refugees. And they have been all sorts of folks in the last, I believe the program was set up in the mid-90s in the last 10, 15 years. You know, people from the Balkans, Bosnians and others, uh, people from Africa, Somali Bantu, people from the Thai Burmese border, um, Burmese, Karen, uh, ethnic group and other ethnic groups. So there's a large diversity. Um, and the university, for instance, is a known center for Tibetan studies. So we have a significant Tibetan population here that, you know, it's kind of like, why here for Tibet? Well, you know, whatever combination of academics and students led to that. So there's really a quite a wide diversity for a, a relatively small town or small area. So in your view, immigrants are overall positively received in our community? I think in general in Virginia they are, and I would say especially so here in, in Virginia, I mean in Charlottesville and Albemarle, it, you know, like any place, it, great difference, you know, creates a certain standoffishness just because, you know, those of us that live our lives day in and day out here you know, don't have any appreciation for, you know, what it was like in a refugee camp in Africa or what it was like to flee the war in Afghanistan or, you know, what it's like to live in the, the jungle on the Thai-Burmese border. And, and we have a very, you know, I, I would argue strong, but, you know, also problematic history with great difference. And we have a ringed endorsements of rights in, in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence, but yet, you know, we counted African Americans as three-fifths of a person, and our treatment of Native Americans wasn't that great. But I think our strength comes in our evolution, in our, our recognition, albeit slow by some people's standards, of the fact that the humanity, again, is what counts. And it takes us a while sometimes when we're encountered with great difference and you know people from a completely different culture are doing things different ways both in the family and the workplace whatever but it's that individual contact when you actually get to know your neighbor and understand the efforts put in and I think Virginians and Charlottesvillians are are good that way. I mean, they so recognize that. reception is not then contingent particularly on economic situation. No. Well, I think we have a, a class issue in the United States that, and I don't mean to get into you know kind of a whole uh, no, it's fine. idea of, of of political and economic class issues, but you know the income gap has been widening in the United States over the last 
you know, couple decades. And I think that plays out in immigration as well. I mean, low income immigrants, it's, it's, many of them are undocumented, but even those that are documented, there's some suspicion or, you know, there's, uh, there's some issues that are playing out in our society about income inequality or income disparity. And I don't really think immigrants are much different. I really think it's a part of a, gr you know, of an issue, of a larger issue that we have. Of class. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the possibilities. I mean, we still are a very mobile society, but arguably our mobility maybe isn't as great, or certainly you have to climb farther. And, and actually, immigrants often climb fast and hard, and so in some ways, they can do better in that issue, but I really think the economic issue is is kind of writ large across our society as opposed to specific mm -hmm. to immigration. What unique psychological and emotional stresses do immigrant families experience here in our community? Well, I don't know that our community presents them with specific problems or difficulties in that regard that aren't present for, for most immigrants. And in some ways we're probably a better, we have you know, more resources for a smaller, uh, for a smaller community, you know, obviously don't have as many resources as a big metro area in DC or New York. Um, but I mean, we think of ourselves so much as oriented around home and family and, you know, family values. I mean, these are people that have been uprooted and our system, and even if they've chosen to become uprooted, that doesn't mean they still don't wish that they could have greater contact with, you know, their families, their community, you know, just what was Sunday dinner or Friday dinner back home. And, you know, and in Charlottesville, there is probably a little bit more disconnection in that regard, because, you know, we're not New York City. We can't have, you know, lots of different ethnic food supermarkets and stuff, and people have to work harder for just some of the simple things that make the taste and flavor of home or their former home, you know, be accessible. Where are some of the places that people can go for support in this town? Well, I mean, IRC, is a, as I mentioned, um, Creciendo Juntos is this wonderful group, you know, oriented around Latinos, it means growing together, that brings together the social service agencies, you know, school, ESL, uh, you know, English as second language, adult ed, um, health groups, uh, you know, nonprofits, the faith community. And um, while there isn't as specific a group for the wider immigrant community, I mean, you know, for instance, the Tibetan community has a strong support group in the university or amongst, you know, various academics and, and a center there. Um, you know, the IRC works with, there's some other nonprofits that support immigrants and refugees. So, I mean, there are different agencies in town, all of them are cognizant of the, of yeah, that do the social service work and the and work with the low income, because those are the immigrants that end up hitting the the service sector. I mean, the ones who do well, you know, have some education, get a good job. I mean, they're off towards the middle class and not usually intersecting with the the systems as much as some of the work. Does the University Hospital in Martha Jefferson, for instance, have particular programs or vehicles that people can avail themselves of for help? We've had clients that have gotten services at, at Martha Jefferson, although I don't know the specific structure there, but at UVA there's the International, and apologize Dr. Hauk if I don't have the name right, but it's the International Family Medicine Clinic that does a very good job with you know the, the refugees and particularly the IRC folks and other immigrants as well because they often present health issues that you know you wouldn't see in central Virginia. Um, and so that's a, a specialized service that that is very good for folks here. Um, so and then, you know, for those, you know, in immigrant populations, like any other population, you have some of the domestic issues and abuse issues and, you know, the, the She Shelter, the Shelter for Help in Emergency, SARA, the Sexual Assault Resource Agency, the Women's Center, all those groups have very, have programs that work with the immigrant populations. And we've worked with them because that's one of the few ways at the immigration clinic that the undocumented or quasi-documented can, you know, the kind of narrow uh, mechanisms that exist for them to become permanent residents. Uh, in the people that you deal with, um, is the current backlog on uh, the green card uh, applications being accepted? Is that is that something that plays in very strongly? 
Well, the immigration clinic is set up very much as a, you know, kind of a pro bono public service project at the law school. So we deal with the low income and we specifically partnered with the Legal Aid Justice Center, which, you know, the legal aid movement across the country is about serving the low income. So we tend to see the people who actually don't even have permanent residence yet or, or um, having difficulties on their way. But I mean, the permanent residence backlogs reflects, as, as Professor Martin was saying, you know, the difficulty in Congress about figuring out how to do it. And it, it's really a question now that these, you know, the last couple of years the administration's fees have gone up, which are, can be hard, but which have allowed processing to catch up. It's, it's a structural issue with the laws. And it's hard for, you know, the permanent residents to understand that. And it's hard for Americans who get involved with immigrants to understand that because it's like, why do they have to be separated? Well, the law says we're only going to take so many in such categories. And, and one of the things that I think Americans don't understand or maybe don't acknowledge as much is that immigration is a backhanded compliment. I mean, the strength, immigrants want to come here because we've got a strong, dynamic society. And that's especially true, arguably, with undocumented immigration. I mean, these are people who are risk takers. These are people who kind of fit into that idea of the American dream who want to do something different, make something more for themselves and their families. And it can be hard when they've kind of fit that idea and value, which is not, which is not a misconception of how we view ourselves now, but they may not understand all the technicalities that go in with making those making those systems real. The American dream has gets enmeshed in bureaucracy from time Unfortunately, to time. Unfortunately, uh, more so than we all want. Um, what, you mentioned the Legal Aid Justice Center, um, of which you are part. How specifically does it serve this community of Charlottesville? Um, what are some more areas of particular legal concern? Well, immigrants, well, for, oh, give me a quick story of how the immigration clinic got, uh, got founded is really a, a story of how the Legal Aid Justice Center works with, with immigrants. There had been a program at the Legal Aid Justice Center to get immigrant workers paid. Immigrants were coming documented, undocumented, and unfortunately there's always, you know, there are always the bad apples, the bad actors, the outliers. And it could be even easier if immigrants felt like they didn't understand what rights they had and um, you know legal remedies they had or if they felt like their status was in some ways in jeopardy status meaning their ability to be here so there you know is a phenomena of employers taking advantage of immigrants not all employers but there's you know some group and so they had an uh, a program to get immigrant workers paid and they'd occasionally run into you know immigrant workers who could improve their status could change their status could get status who hadn't done it but that's a different type of work and so the immigration clinic was very much founded to deal with those folks and you know there's housing there's um you know, there's very various civil advocacy uh, programs, and they will take immigrant clients, you know, like they will citizen clients. So, you know, if an immigrant has a housing issue, I mean, it can be just a, a lower income American, U.S. citizen, but immigrants are welcome as well. But that's a specific way that the Justice Center has has tried to work with the immigrant community and arguably growing immigrant community because the demographics, you know, they the foreign born population in Virginia has risen significantly in the last 10 years. Are po immigrant populations here in Virginia, would you say, the targets of political opportunity? And this is a large issue, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> you say that the, the show is nonpartisan, and our, I think it could be argued that there's a certain uh, part of the political sp spectrum that has felt like, particularly what I will call the undocumented or the unauthorized uh, immigrant population, is both just a conceptual problem, a kind of a rule of law problem, they didn't follow all the rules, but also, you know, an economic drain. And that economic issue is very much disputed. Um, uh, statistics that, you know, we were discussing beforehand show that mm, immigrants contribute more than they, than they, they eventually take out of our, you know, kind of system of public benefits and taxes and all. And, and Paying taxes is something they do because if you are to have a shot at at permanent residence and full status, you got to have paid your taxes. So in many ways, they pay, and they may not get it back. Um, one of the issues often is is people pay into you know social security and then go home. One of the discussions is how do they maybe 
make some of that transferable because it pays in here and then they don't access it. So I don't know that, and how this plays out particularly locally is the local law enforcement, the Prince William County issue. And you know, clearly there, you know, there's a problem when immigrants come across the border, they get a, you know, I've had people walk into my office that say, I have papers. Well, the paper they had was a court, um, basically a court summons to show up in Texas to be an immigration court proceeding. But there was some almost affirmative misunderstanding, misdirection by themselves, by a community, whatever, and they say, I have papers. No, you had a court date that you missed. You now have a deport order. And where does that come from? It's hard to know, but that person in turn has probably been working and paying taxes and trying to be here. And, um, you know, clearly the enforcement priorities is, you know, being talked about it at the federal level, Professor Martin, you know, may make some sense to me, but um, I also think the humanity part, we want to step back and, you know, most of the immigration violations, it's a civil violation. It's not a criminal violation. I mean, potentially they could have been prosecuted for crossing the border illegally, but, you know, it isn't until proven guilty. And I, I think it's helpful to think of what they are contributing and why they're here, which is usually to work. To what degree uh, did the subprime mortgage crisis affect Hispanic immigrants? I'm not an expert on this. I have some friends who work in the, in the legal aid field who, are, who have been doing mortgage issues. And I think, again, the low-income immigrant groups, documented and undocumented, benefited from, um, from looser terms because, uh, you know, I think there was a comment earlier possibly with Professor Martin in our conversation about banking and you know, living in cash because of difficulties, you know, establishing all the kind of financial life that we expect to be able to do. Although the fact is, is if they take the time, many of them can get bank accounts and, and can do things. And, and so the looser standards allowed more people to, to get into homes, which I think for immigrants was probably generally a benefit. But like anybody else, some of them, um, you know, overestimated their abilities to, you know, to carry mortgages, to carry debt. But I, I don't think they were particularly, I don't think they were any more problematic than a lot of just regular Americans, especially because they save so much and send so much home. Most of them are trying to buy a house as well as supporting some extended families someplace else. Assuming that Congress on both sides of the aisle can muster the intestinal fortitude to act and President Obama makes good his promise to address immigration concerns, uh, what kind of progress in, in, uh, in immigration do you envision taking place? Immigration reform of the, of the scope that's been laid out a couple different times by both sides of the aisle in that, which includes legalization of the large majority of the undocumented and some sort of worker visa or worker program that brings in the low income or the lower wage labor that our economy appears to desire, would be a great boon to, to rights and to our whole immigration system because it would remove this, this you know, relatively large group from a gray, you know, arguably jeopardized position where we wouldn't be able to call a group illegal and then argue coherently for, you know, depriving them of some of the benefits to our society. It would put us all back. And the importance of the, of the worker visa is, you know, immigration's a backhanded compliment. Our economy's strong. And yes, we can have arguments about how many immigrants we should have, but we really need to talk about immigration in terms of our economy, not in so much in terms of our national security. It, the people come because they want to work and because they believe there's opportunity. And, you know, the employment indicates even in a tough economy, there is opportunity. And so, I mean, that's a compliment to us that our our values and our economy are as dynamic as they are and, and can take these folks in. One of the things, too, um, people in this situation encounter is that they have to report their incomes and pay taxes without the privileges of a resident uh, U.S. citizen. Um, that's a real difficulty for people, I think. Um, all this being said, should we as a nation and as individual communities be considering new ways to think about human rights for our citizens in waiting? Your thoughts? Well, I guess human rights is kind of gave in my intro to how I came to it. I think that it would be helpful for us 
to have a more nuanced appreciation of our own icons, you know, our own Bill of Rights. You know, that was only for men of property, not even for women, much less, you know, African Americans or Native Americans. And I think our power and the, the strength of our system lies in our values, you know, less than in our military and, and in how those values get played out in the initiative and, and the energy that goes into our economy. And so I think it would be helpful to take a humanity-based view towards rights, even to people that you know may quote unquote be unauthorized, undocumented, illegal, because it it has shown over time that it is our recognition of African Americans, Native Americans, and various disfavored immigrant groups, humanity, which has led that led us to give them the full benefits of participation in society. And you know the fact is, immigrants now that are here for any length of time. You know, many of them are apt to be here just because that's the history we have. We are a pretty welcoming folk, especially when we get to know them. Thank you, Professor Ford, for your insightful analysis Thanks and discussion invite. today. Welcoming a stranger into our own home and making them feel at ease. This is an American value with which most of us are very familiar. Our parents and grandparents spoke to us about it because often they understood all too well the feelings of loneliness and isolation, which come with leaving familiar shores. Moving to a new country is an act of great courage and not for the faint of heart. It is worthy of respect and encouragement. When we look into the faces of our immigrant friends and neighbors, we will always, if we look carefully, find ourselves. I would like to thank Professor Ford for his insightful analysis and discussion today. Thank you at home for listening to our conversation. If you would like more information about the topic we have just discussed, you will find a number of books on immigration on our website at politicsmatters.org. There is also a complete archive of all prior Politics Matters programs, which you may watch in their entirety at any time. We would like to hear from you with all questions, comments, and ideas for future programs. You can email us at info at politicsmatters.org. We air Tuesday and Saturday at 8 p.m. Thank you again, and until next time, I'm Jan Painter, and this is Politics Matters. <laughs>